Opening lines, take one. Hit it, Johnny. Caleb Wesson enters the draft process. A Virginia Beach Buckeye stock continues to climb. And a preview of the XFL round two comes in the form of Ohio State's hard-hitting spring game. All that and more coming up on Unscripted Ohio? That's correct. You are now listening to the Unscripted Ohio podcast. Brought to you by Buckeye Grove and in part by JFQ Lending. All your home purchase and refinance needs should be handled by a Buckeye. You'll never pay for your appraisal with these guys. Licensed in 33 states and more on the way. Check them out at jfqlending.com. For the latest news, notes, analysis, and discussion, check us out on buckeyegrove.com and follow us on Twitter at unscriptedohio1. Now, broadcasting from Podcast Central, a place that is not his mother's basement. Hey, Ma, can we get some meatloaf? We promise. Here's your host, Kyle Lamb. Hey, Ma, the meatloaf! Right on. We are broadcasting from a place that is not my mother's basement. And uh, as you heard the voice in the open, uh, I am not alone today. Uh, I am Kyle Lamb. We are brought to you by Buckeye Grove and also our title sponsor, JFQ Lending. And you might be wondering who the heck Johnny is. I hope you're not wondering that because it means you're not listening to the Scarlet and Gray podcast. But Johnny Lunsford, co-host, co-coordinator of the Scarlet and Gray podcast, joins (laughs) me. Johnny, it is great to be with you. This is the first time we've been able to do this. I've I've done a little cross promo with you and Corey before, but this is the first time that you and I have been able to go some one-on-one time. Yes, it's nice for it to actually uh, culminate into what it was supposed to be. You and I realized that the cross promo with me and Corey was meant to get to this moment right here. And uh, instead, you had to backtrack and take just Corey a few times. But it's nice to uh, to bring it all together for once. Corey felt a little insulted that I uh, that I referred to him as a backup plan. Yeah, I don't know why. I think uh, he should embrace that role and, and uh, you know, the co-coordinator, you know, the co-coordinator, the co-coordinator knows he's the backup. Well, you know, the thing about Corey is, you know, he's like a horse. You know, he can get you where you need to go, but you got to give him a little push. You got to take the reins. <laughs> you got to guide him a little bit, rub his neck and say, good boy, good boy. You know, <laughs> you, you just got to give him a gentle nudge to go in the right direction. And then when he's all played out, you take him out back and shoot him. <laughs> it's a... Uh, well, it's time to go to the glue factory, Corey. <laughs> Dog food it is. No, it's it's like, except you don't tell them that. Actually, it's it's like when you're a parent and you tell your kids that we're taking we're taking the dog to a nice farm where he can roam free. And I, I've come to find out in my adult life that that's not actually true. Like that's just a euphemism, and I didn't know that as a kid. Wow, you're actually, that actually literally happened to one of my pets when I was a kid. So thanks for bringing that up. That was literally the story I was told too. Yes, it was the same. I was told too. And I thought, you know, I was 13 and my my puppy, you know, wild Australian shepherd. And I loved that thing, but he was wild. And my parents told me he was taken (laughs) to a a nice farm where he was going to go roam the countryside. And uh, I don't want to, I don't want to make this a depressing show, but it turns out that that is not the case. Yeah, yeah, my story is equally. <laughs> M- mine actually, I do think ended up at a, as a farm, but I'm sure not what you brought me here to talk to, talk with me about. I'm sure. No, it is definitely not. We're here to talk. I mean, we got a lot of things to talk about. We got the spring game, of course. Uh, by the way, if you are going to the spring game and still need last minute travel travel plans, uh, might I recommend Go Bus? Uh, we are supported by Go Bus. You can ride to over 40 stops across to Ohio, connecting rural communities to Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati. Get to Ohio State games, including the Saturday spring game with Go Bus, and bring comfort back to traveling. You can book your uh, ride on ridegobus.com or call 1 95 Go Bus. That is ridegobus.com or 1 95 Go Bus. So, Johnny, yeah, we've got we got the spring game to talk about. That is coming up on Saturday. A little bit of basketball talk as Caleb Wesson declares for the NBA draft. I know that surprised a few people, but we will talk about the ramifications of that and what that actually means. And uh, we'll talk a little bit of recruiting, too, because there's a lot of recruiting buzz going on. Um, and people are really hyped up about the 2020 class. Uh, but let's talk about the spring game first. I know 
you're used to this number two or number one chair here, as they say in the industry. And, and now I'm pushing you over to the number two chair where I'm kind of taking the reins here and, and guiding the show. Uh, what are you looking for in the spring? Actually, let me, let me back up uh, <laughs> because this spring game, um, I don't want to hype the game too much because man, this thing has become, I understand why Ryan day and company is doing it, but this thing is watered down. I, it, is there any way of actually being excited about this game now, given what we've learned the format is going to be? You know, I really look forward to the spring game. I think I can, I learn a pretty good bit from it, but this, this year after, man, it, I think the most depressing part is how much shorter it is. I don't know. I think you just have to kind of tell yourself it's going to be great. It's springtime and you get some football. So, uh, and and the the highlight of it all is if the game is absolutely terrible you have the satisfaction of knowing that Corey drove from central florida <laughs> just to watch it uh poor poor guy <laughs> win, win. poor guy when i spoke to him uh, thursday afternoon he was he was battling car accidents all over the place and he was like a couple hours behind and he sounded grumpy i uh, you you will if it monsoons rain Saturday in Columbus, you'll see my smiling face right in the middle of it, knowing that Corey drove all the way up for that monsoon. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the only smiling guy of the 70,000. Yeah, imagine, you know, so Corey, if for, for those of you that don't know, lives down in central Florida, so he's got, you know, about a 20-hour drive ahead of him as he heads up to Columbus, Ohio for the spring game. And this is a spring game he's coming up for that we've learned now. Uh, the quarters are going to be shortened to 10 minutes apiece with a running clock in the second half. And we're not even going to have full tackling anymore. It used to be that, you know, the quarterback was off limits, but you would have general tackling the rest of the game, you know, the running backs and, and wide receivers and everything. But we're not even going to get that. We're going to get uh, what they're calling thuds up tackling, which basically means, you know, you, you know, you're going to get into the shoulder, you're going to get into their chest and then, you know, you know, kind of spring up and then that'll be the end of the play. Uh, Johnny, I feel when I heard this, the thuds up tackling, I feel like this sounds to me like a drill you guys would have done in battleships at, at the Great Lakes or something. Uh, did you do any thuds up tackling there? <laughs> No, no, we did not. It is now a kindler, gentler Navy. Um, and <laughs> that would be called recruit to recruit contact. And we, we can't allow any of that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just, uh, so we're not going to get any true tackling, which, which really takes the luster off. I mean, granted Justin Fields wouldn't have been tackled anyway, but we're really now, I think not going to get <laughs> a very good sense of his running ability. Cause there's really not much point now. Uh, it's, you know, look, I, I get what they're doing. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to have injuries, and I completely understand that. But, uh, you know, it's getting to the point, like, what's the point of having this game other than making money for the athletic department? It, it feels like a money grab at this point. I know it's probably a good recruiting opportunity for the coaching staff because they can bring in people. They can bring in, you know, key recruits with the spring visits and say, hey, look, we've got 100,000 people coming to see a spring exhibition game, and it's not going to be 100,000 because, you know, we've got the shortened capacity for this weekend at 76,000. But, is there any reason now to have this game under the circumstance given it's watered down so much other than, you know, a money grab? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's for us and not for them at all. The fact that the staff has watered it down and by us, I mean the fans, yeah, the fans, uh, a money grab for the, the university, but as far as the actual team, I think, they're kind of showing their cards of, Hey, we're doing this because we have to. And since we have to, I'm going to make it as at least like football as I possibly can. Um, I, I don't particularly like that, but I understand it. It makes me wonder if Ryan day, when he was a coordinator, wasn't on the sideline the whole time during these games going, why are we doing this? Oh, this is the dumbest way to get somebody hurt. But uh, it, it's for us. Enjoy it is all I can say because, you know, you think about that running clock in the second half. That's, <laughs> I mean, what what else is he going to do? Tell him to milk the play clock down to two before every snap. Well, and that begs the question: Can people enjoy this format? I, I mean, I guess we'll find out on Saturday. But I mean, 
when I heard that, I'm like, well, I'm not going to have any enjoyment. I mean, here I am talking about this. I, I spent, you know, 10 bucks to, to get these tickets to go over. I mean, you're coming in from Virginia. Corey's coming in from Florida. I don't know if that would have been the case if we had known the format ahead of time. Uh, but we are still going. But can we really enjoy this and how long until people don't enjoy it and just say, screw it? You know, there's no sense in going to watch. Yeah, and I think, though, when I, when I saw the thud it up thing, to me, that kind of says momentum stopping. Well, it's hard to stop somebody's momentum from behind without knocking them down. Uh, so I, I think you're going to see some people get taken off their feet. Um, and this this might be their way of saying, if you get knocked down, that's fine. But we're trying to avoid piles and stuff. But you're right. It does diminish the game. You think back, Kyle, to last year and I think even the year before, when you saw Tate Martell get loose, he got called back for just getting touched, like by a fingertip, and you were like, "Man, I would have, I liked, I would have liked to seen if he can actually get away from that, or if they can actually tackle him." Uh, so you're right; it it makes you. There's probably going to be some runs by Justin Fields where you go, "Well, I know they caught him, but I don't know if they would have actually been able to bring him down from that angle." I guess we won't know until next fall. You know, Johnny Corey made it a big point. He wanted us to talk about reminding people to temper their enthusiasm and expectations because there's inevitably going to be somebody awarded the Brandon Child- Bam Childress Award for uh, spring game sensation and a great performance. And uh, it won't be Demario McCall as, as, a, as a popular pick here recently, but he's because he's not going to be playing as he's sitting out. But Corey wanted me to remind people to temper your enthusiasm after the spring game. But I kind of feel like, you know, the format is going to temper that by nature, right? I mean, how excited can you really be about anybody's performance given we're not even going to see true tackling and, you know, you're only going to see 10 minutes. You're going to see a running clock in the second half. It kind of feels like it's just natural now. Nobody should be carried away about anything they see here. Yeah, unless the person is just really, really young, and then you can always say, well, they're so young look what they did with other great athletes out there. The future is bright. Um, and yeah, I actually think this is the Mario McCall's first year to not be the spring game hero, which is a good thing. You always see the spring game hero as like a fringe player. That's not quite a three, but he's not quite, you know, a starter. He's not, he's barely cracking the rotation. Last year, Ben Victor was really showing out in the spring game. And I was sitting there thinking, this is not a good thing for you <laughs> because you were you were wanting to be in the lineup. Now, Austin Max injury forced him in the lineup more. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think regardless of what you just said, Kyle, if Garrett Wilson has more than five catches, people are going to forget the format's awful. And he, <laughs> he, they're going to say, yeah, we were right about this kid. Do you ha- is that your if you had to pick a spring game sensation for this year is Garrett Wilson your uh, your pick or do you have somebody else in mind? Yeah, it'd be hard to say it's him because you just don't know how far up the depth chart he's moved. But I like to think of a fringe player. Um, is is uh, do I have this right? Is Jalen Gill? Is he on the? He's playing, correct? Yeah, he's he's playing. He's a guy that I would think would be there because I've been hearing some whisperings that he's moving up the depth chart, but with, uh, with, with the people that we know have to be in front of him or we think would be in front of him. I think he'll be that guy that plays snaps this year, but he's not, you know, he's not cracking the starting lineup. Uh, and he'll be that safety valve, especially if he gets put with the second string quarterback, second string O line, they need some quick releases. Uh, I would I would think Jalen Gill, and if not Gill, it, it would have to be Olave. Or you know, excuse me, not Olave, Garrett Wilson. Given the track record of these games, I feel like it's it's usually a receiver, and so I'm going to stay with that position group. I think it'll be somebody like you said, a fringe player like C.J. Saunders. I could see Saunders having like ten catches and 150 yards in this game, and everybody <laughs> freaking out about it. Because uh, he's he's somebody that's trying to to get into that too deep, you know, and, and get some playing time this year. So I feel like he's the guy I could see having a huge game. I agree. I I would have said his name probably. I didn't realize he still had eligibility. What is he? A ninth year senior? <laughs> a fifth year senior. But it does. Feel, <laughs> he, he's one of those guys that feels like he's been around nine years. Like like remember Evan Eschmeyer, basketball player for Notre Dame. I like I, I I'm. 
I could swear if I were to look up his stats, he probably was around Northwestern for 11 seasons. Yeah, the uh, Luke May in North Carolina kind of gives you that feel too. Yeah, we we I can confirm Luke May is actually gone now from North Carolina. I'm I'm sure of that. <laughs> At least I'm pretty sure of that until he shows up on next year's roster. <laughs> Um, so, Johnny, another guy that's been on the other side of the ball, a, a guy that's been drawing rave reviews all spring, partially because of opportunity, but also because of talent, is Terada Mitchell. You know, they we know Tough Borland has not played because of injury. He sat out all spring. And he went out play on Saturday. Uh, Baron Browning has been out a lot because of injury. Uh, I believe he is expected to play, uh, whereas Borland will not. But Mitchell... We know a five-star guy, you know, huge talent. And because of, you know, the underperformance at, at that position last year, there is a lot of hype around him and hope that he can, you know, maybe step up and if not win the job, at least push for, you know, push those other two to be better. Uh, you know, what are your expectations for him and that and that spot in general with the, the battle of those three? You know, I think he can look pretty good tomorrow. I, it's hard to the one of his specialties being hard hits though, you know he can't shine too much, uh, but I I do think overall he is probably the best natural, true Ohio State caliber middle linebacker on the roster. However, man, Borland's been starting for a year and a half. I I could see him tying him for the position but as a tie you usually think that goes to the the uh the upperclassmen um but you know i think it'll all come down to b- between the years if he can if he can uh beat Borland out in that aspect i think he could definitely make a push now browning browning's been on the record saying he he prefers being outside and he prefers being moved around but because of need we you know we try him out at the middle but with taraja i think he can be starter ready by the fall i don't know that that means he starts though because of the depth that we will then have um i think he can be uh the next two years though uh, a type of a raekwon mcmillan type of player uh or even maybe even better uh really really bright future and it sh- it it goes to show you the hype is real that he got an opportunity due to injury and that right away people are going wow wow uh, and from what I understand, the staff really wanted him to enroll early last year, and he didn't get to. So all signs are pointing up for Taraja Mitchell. Yeah, see, I think you hit the nail on the head uh, with the Browning possibility because, you know, if you look at it individually, I think Browning Browning is the guy with the athletic talent but has not displayed maybe the instincts of Borland uh, or mm-hmm. presumably Mitchell. We haven't seen Mitchell as much, but uh, he, he, has, he definitely has not had the same instincts as Borland. He's got the athletic ability, though. Whereas, you know, Borland has shown the instincts and is a good run stopper, but he, you know, he's not as quick and is not going to be as good in this short intermediate passing game when he has to drop back and and, into coverage. I think Mitchell is a nice blend of the two where, you know, we know he's known for the big hits. He can be a a good run stopper, but I thought, I think he's also athletic enough where he can, uh, you know, be an asset in pass coverage. And so I, I think it could come down to him and Borland with the, the possibility of Browning eventually making the move to the outside. Yeah, and what's going to be interesting, Kyle, is he, we're hearing with the bullet package and with Sean Wade being a uh, a, a nickel who is uh, perhaps a, a starting nickel package, that, that brings you down to two linebackers. So now we have five guys sometimes playing for two positions that's going to be really interesting because it's almost like Pete Werner is an afterthought. He, he started all last year. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how those snaps break down. Depth is obviously a good thing to have, uh, but I, I have no idea exactly how it'll look, especially with the new Madison system. And that's especially true. If, if in fact they are as high on getting Brendan White on the field in this new package, in this new in this new scheme, if they're as high on him as we're led to believe they are, you're right. That that takes away some playing time for some of those other outside linebackers that we've seen the last couple of years. Yeah, it really does. And him, pl- I, I agree with putting him up there. It's just you know how do you, somebody's feelings are probably going to get hurt 
uh, if you just are having two line a two linebacker rotation, um, and especially with Sean Wade, you know he he needs to be in there at, at some point. So uh, I, I I look for us to have a very fast, very fresh back seven. I mean, you, you're thinking about it, Kyle. You 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 can see. Could you imagine Warner and Browning both in on, as the third down linebackers with uh, Brennan White back there as the bullet? And then you have Fuller and Pryor or, or Wade and Arnett flying around in Okuda. That's, that's a really fast don't, – don't get in third and long against those guys. Yeah, I, I will say we will not see this. In my opinion, we would not see the same issue of guys flying across the field, catching the ball seven, eight yards deep, and then turning the corner and getting first downs. I don't think we're going to see that being a problem much longer if Ohio State has that personnel out there. No, not at all. Uh, speed everywhere, and uh, and, and I th- hopefully they just won't be walked up to the line of scrimmage every other play. You know, it, it, speaking of the back seven, so so the DBs, at least on paper, should be really, really good. I know that second safety spot is still kind of a question mark until we see if Josh Proctor can live up to the hype or not. I think he will, but, you know, we got to see it first. But the cornerback, certainly, you know, you've got Okuda and Wade and, of course, Damon Arnett. Uh, at least on paper, there should be no issues with guys being able to man up this year. I, I don't see teams being able to throw on Ohio State in their in the times that they're in man press coverage this year. No, I I, I don't either. And for all the struggles uh, that Arnett had, you know, last year it seemed like down the field, uh, they were all of them, all of them, really good. And I will say, even Akuda really excels at this. I attribute it to whatever the coaching staff was doing. The underneath stuff, they were all really good at. Uh, so if it's a, a deep passing situation and you have the speed of a Proctor or a Fuller flying around back there over top, uh, you would really have to have somebody fooled to, to be able to, to consistently get behind these guys. I, I don't think it's going to happen unless you, like, you, you just have something drawn up you know, once every – seven four or five games that you might see somebody get by him yeah I I think you know Arnett was interesting because he got a bad rap last year I thought because you know him and and to to an extent Sheffield who got better throughout the year uh, you know Sheffield was bad early on in the year but he got better but I thought Arnett was fairly consistent most of the way through I thought Arnett's biggest problem was just you know he was there in coverage most of the time he just did a poor job reacting and sometimes that caused some of those defensive pass interference penalties that we saw with him a lot but I feel like he was like 90% of the way there from being a really, really good cover corner. It's just that last 10% of, of realizing when the ball is in the air and reacting to it and getting adjusted. That seemed to be his only weakness. And I feel like with a year of experience, I, I don't think we're going to see that be a problem for him this year. Well, yeah, and you would like to think Coach Halfley would, would uh, uh, be able to, to correct some of those mistakes. You're right. Even even when Sheffield, Sheffield got mossed more than anybody I know, <laughs> but the reason he was getting mossed is because he was in position. I mean, he was often chest to chest with the receiver making a play, and when plays were made on Arnett, he usually was in position too. Uh, part of that is quarterbacks and receivers are getting so good at that back shoulder in that high point that's, now. That's all they work that, on. Yeah, they they work on that consistently now. That's a really tough thing to defend. Yeah, and for all the people that were saying last year, well, you can't get your head around because if you turn too soon, I'm like, yeah, I get that. But nowadays, these guys are just too good at placing the ball. You remember back to two years ago what uh, Lego at Indiana did against us. <laughs> and uh, so you would like to think the new technique uh, with – we what we had last year I don't think was an athleticism problem at DB. It was a technique issue. And – that's the better issue to have because you can fix technique. You can't all the time get more athletic. You know, it'll be interesting to see. So I, I, I want to kind of move this discussion from, I'm going to stay at the same position because we've got legend Cavazos committing uh, here on Friday today. If you're, you're listening to this on Friday, that, then he's supposed to be committing today. It's believed he's going to re up his commitment to Ohio state. And there's just so much momentum, you know, with Cavazos and, and Paris Johnson, uh, you know, starting to act a little bit more like a commitment. You've got um, 
you know, all these receivers that Ohio State is looking at, Kendall Milton, you know, having a lot of great things to say about his visit this past week. There is so much momentum, I think, with that class with Ohio State. It just feels like it's going to – there was some uncertainty there after after Urban Meyer stepped down. But, you know, Johnny, I got to tell you, this this class just seems to be coming together like it's going to be a, uh, a historic one for Ohio State. Yeah, and I think the way they recruited in 2019 kind of – tip their hand that 2020 was their focus anyway because it's such a deep class i think this thing can really take off uh i just got a message that a, another crystal ball came in for drennan to go to osu so yeah, it's a it's a deep class across the board uh it seems like especially the skill position and um yeah i, I think it's gonna be really good a really good class uh you you wonder who the big you, you can't get them all <laughs> You wonder who the big loss is you're going to take, but uh, just just the Paris and Legend recommitment, I think, will kind of say, uh, you know, the seas have calmed. The questions about Ryan Day, Ryan Day, have been answered. It, it's back to business as usual. Ohio State didn't miss a beat. Have we ever seen? You know, I, I guess maybe you could argue. Uh, with Oklahoma, uh, you know, after Bob Stoops, t- you know, uh, you know, took o- or after Bob Stoops retired, maybe the same thing happened a little bit to o- with Oklahoma. But have we seen other than maybe that situation w- with Lincoln Riley? Have we seen so much hype in such a little time as we're seeing right now with Ryan Day taking over? Because now, I mean, you've got twenty twenty one kids, you know, texting each other, basically saying Ohio State is the it school if you're a quarterback or a receiver right now. I mean, it's 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 just incredible how much uh, his reputation has spread with NFL people, with, with quarterback coaches, with high school coaches. Uh, you know, Ohio State is quickly becoming the it school for that position. And I said this to Corey a couple weeks ago when he was on. If, if, in fact, Justin Fields lives up to the hype and reputation and the expectations this year and year one, you're going to have back-to-back with Haskins and now Justin Fields for two years. You're going to have... Ohio State proving it on the field, and it seems like Ryan Day can get whoever he wants at that position going forward. Yeah, and especially with a loaded 2020 uh, receiving class, you know, even if even if you don't land a Fleming, and uh, and you don't and, uh, a or a Jarrett, I think G Scott's going to be really really good. I think uh, Smith Nigba is going to be good too. Uh, so I almost wonder, Kyle, I was thinking about this. Maybe you have the answer is our angle. And well, Jack Miller coming in and Ryan day, keeping that intact is uh, huge. Um, is our angle going to be, we get the best quarterbacks because we have the best receivers or we're getting the best receivers because we have the best quarterback and best system. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just kind of let them uh, reciprocate. huh? I, I, think, I think, it, I think it is a little bit, I mean, you could argue the chicken and the egg, uh, paradox if you want, but I, I think it's a little bit of both. I really do. I, I think it's just a culmination of the coaching and the receiving and just everything together. I think that, you know, the quarterback momentum with the receiver momentum, I think they kind of go hand in hand because these guys are texting each other. You know, you've got Kyle McCord coming on campus with Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, and, and that'll be an interesting relationship because as Mark Gibbler pointed out a few weeks ago or last week, you know, it's like, does Ohio State maybe go in the direction of a quarterback that, that they might like a teeny tiny bit more than the cord? Uh, and you risk, you know, losing Marvin Harrison, or do you go with the bird in the hand analogy where you like McCord enough to take him and getting him in, you don't have the risk of losing the other quarterbacks, plus you have a better chance at Marvin Harrison. But there's a lot of that going on. So I think that that, that is a very reciprocal relationship uh, with the quarterbacks and receivers right now. Well, and another thing, Kyle, and I don't know if this will be – if we continue to recruit like we like, it, it looks like we're going to at Ohio State and wide receiver. Ohio State might be a transfer hotbed for people to transfer out. It be being dog eat dog as it is because we forget Matt Baldwin's really good. Yes, and uh, we don't know what's going to be coming him. You would like to think if Justin Fields sticks around. You know, he's he's going to have Jack Miller coming from behind him. He'd be sandwiched between him and Justin Fields. Not a lot of people would fault him. 
uh, for transferring. And then continuing on, you just see quarterback after quarterback. When you stack them with no space between each class with a really good player, uh, that's not a bad thing, <laughs> but it's almost a good thing to say, hey, if you were really, really good at quarterback, you can go to Ohio State, and if you're really, really good, then you'll get on the field at Ohio State. And I think we might see that some this year because, you know, if you're Ohio State, you got to make sure, especially early in the season, Matthew Baldwin, even if he gets beat out for the starting job, they're going to make sure he gets on the field because, A, they want to keep him engaged, but, B, you know, he's only one snap away from possibly being uh, the – you know, the starter at Ohio State and the only scholarship quarterback remaining on, on the roster for this season. So they're going to have to get Baldwin involved early on, even if he doesn't beat out fields for the starting job. Maybe there there's your answer to why why the uh, spring game rules are as wide as they are. Yeah, that, that, two, that's, certainly, on Ross. that's certainly part of it. They can't afford an, a quarterback injury. That's, that's for sure. Um, so, hey, I want to switch gears here before we wrap it up, Johnny. So we have some basketball news this week, which we weren't expecting. It's not really a big deal, uh, which we will get to, but Caleb Wesson declared for the NBA draft, and I know that threw some people for a loop. Um, this seems to be a case where he truly is just going through the process. He, he will have until mid-May now to go to the combine, uh, to speak with teams, to, to work out for teams. And because of the new rules now, he actually can hire an agent so, we, you know, I know some people were asking on Twitter after this got announced on Wednesday. It's like, well, is Wesson hiring an agent? Well, the answer is it doesn't matter because he can actually hire an agent now. He can consult with an agent. Uh, an agent could take him to dinner, could treat him to basic expenses. So he can actually even hire an agent and get consulting work and then go through the process. And then if he decides, you know, he's not going to be drafted or not going to be drafted high enough, he can actually come back to Ohio State. So I know people are freaking out about this, but I truly feel like this is just Caleb Wesson kind of testing testing the ice a little bit and just see where his game is, working out against some better competition and see what he needs to work on. And he will be back, in my opinion, with Ohio State next year. Yeah, I think the headline is scarier than the reality. And also, you know, it's, it's taken us all – getting you some acclimation to the new rules, right? Like you said, the first question everybody asked was, hey, agent, where's the agent? And like you said, well, it's different now. It's more player friendly. It's more go dip your toe in the water friendly and see what you need to work on and then come right back. No harm, no foul, no questions asked. And uh, he obviously is the guy of, of this year and next year that, you know, would if anybody would get, and even next year, get drafted you think would be him um and i've said it before i think he came along and, and i don't mean this because i don't mean his career is over but he came along 10 or 12 15 years too late because he is such a stereotypical big body good soft touch good footwork center true center that the game's getting away from uh that you can see why he would want to go. Now, obviously, he can step out and hit the three now, but he he, he knows that you're not drafting guys that his his build in the NBA a lot. So it's good for him. I agree with him. Let him go see uh, what he needs to work on, what some GMs, what some people say about him, and uh, let him build from there. He's an interesting case because he's somebody you don't see a lot that is a really, really good college player with the potential to be an exceptional college player. But his NBA draft stock is so limited because, you know, he's a 6'9", big body. He's not very quick. He, you know, he doesn't, he's got good footwork, but he's not, he doesn't have quick feet. You know, he doesn't have the size and athleticism in terms of height or length to, to really do well at the next level. And like you said, he can step out and hit a three, which, is, which helps – but there's not much in between that he can really do to be a, an effective post player in the NBA. So he's kind of in a position where I feel like he has to play those third and fourth seasons at Ohio State and just try to shed some weight and continue to be quicker. And that's going to be a positive for Ohio State because he can be one of the best college centers that we've seen in the Big Ten in the last many years because he has that kind of ability. It's just his sheer athleticism and quickness is going to work against him for the next level. Yeah, yeah, the game's changing, and uh, he's doing what he needs to do to change with it. So, you know, he is a big part 
obviously, of what Ohio State wants to do in the 2019-2020 season. And I'm curious what you think about this, because we saw a couple of these, you know, two early top 25 polls come out. And, you know, we saw ESPN had Ohio State 10th. There were a couple of writers that had Ohio State, I think, 8th. Some had them 12th, 15th, which all seems to be the range that Ohio State is falling in with Weston returning and, you know, Luther Muhammad and, you know, some of these guys, you know, and then you've got C.J. Walker transferring in with that recruiting class. Uh, but there was one I saw... It just goes to show where Ohio State's expectation level is next year. Jason McIntyre had Ohio State ranked fourth. Um, You know, I I think even the most optimistic of Ohio State fan is probably rolling their eyes on that one a little bit. But (laughs) but we are in a uh, very exciting time next year. Even Chris Holtman kind of, you know, embraced the expectation and saying, I wouldn't have taken a job like this if I weren't you know, wanting to step into those kind of expectations. So it's interesting now because now Holtman has his work cut out for him because the talent and expectation level next year, it's definitely there. So it's time to see how it translates on the court. Yeah. And, and you know, what I wonder is like uh, the same, like what you talked about with quarterback, who falls off the plate? What sophomore next year is going to get, that we that showed promise is going to get their minutes diminished. You know, I, I look for either Washington or Orange to not quite be the force we thought they might be next year. Not because they're not really good shooters, it's just because look what who's coming in behind them. Um, but depth is always a good thing. It seems like we have a lot of it though it, on the wing and, and not in the post right now. Uh, but yeah, that moving forward. The, Signs are pointing up. I am interested to see just how good DJ Carton can be. And I, I, Jason McIntyre must think he's awfully good. <laughs> for, uh, I mean, I think he's pretty good, but I think there is a, a shock that comes with that next level of competition always. Um, and, you know, I think it even started, you and I, I think, got asked uh, privately uh, in a group, what was it? Uh, it? Could DJ possibly be a one and done? And I that thought never really entered my mind. And, and then all this hype circulates around, and then even Ohio State fans are going, "Is he that good?" Um, and, you know, t- first I, I need to tell you, I need to find out what McIntyre was drinking because I may need need to sneak some of that into Ohio Stadium on Saturday for the spring game. Given the given, well, for, for what it's worth, he also had. I'm pretty sure he's the one that had Tyler Hero going in the first round of the NBA draft too. So yeah, that, you know, I I yeah, I shook my head at that, but then I've seen that from a couple different places. I, Jeff Goodman even insinuated he might be first rounder, which shocks the the heck out of me. Uh, but but as far going back to DJ Carton, yeah, it, we have been asked that. You know, can can DJ Carton be a one and done player? And 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 my my response to that is like I don't think so but I didn't think Mike Conley was ready to be a one and done when he arrived at Ohio State and I was I was a bigger Conley fan than most people but I would have never imagined him being good enough to be a one and done and be the number four pick in the NBA draft so I'm going to say you know DJ Carton it's probably going to come down to his shooting if if that is even going to be in the conversation or not if he if he shoots it better than he has so far uh, the ceiling is the limit for him but the great thing about this for Ohio State is while all the hype is surrounding Carton, you know, C.J. Walker is going to be a very, very good player for Ohio State. He's not as talented as Carton. He, you know, he doesn't have the elite athleticism, the elite quickness, but he's a very good ball handler. He can shoot it pretty well. He's a smart player. He defends. He's great all-around point guard option for Ohio State, and I think lessens the uh, the, the load that Carton is going to have to to carry for Ohio State in his first year as a Buckeye point guard. Yeah, and you know, I, and you you'll have to uh, refer back to me back to Conley. One one thing that I I wonder that will play against DJ's draft status is his need. I don't think we will need for him to be the man next year. We will just need him to be good, but not the man because you're going to have Luther and you're going to have uh, Caleb, and you know, hopefully Andre even takes the next step. So. I know NBA GMs and, and draft scouts don't always look at stats. They look at ceiling. But uh, you would think that right there would almost ensure that he sticks around at least one more year. And uh, it, it will be interesting to see a, a scoring point guard in a Chris Holtman system 
that will be fun to see because you know he's a very he seems to be a very structured and team oriented type of coach. I don't want to get ahead here and, and get people too <laughs> too excited, but if you look at that roster, not just next year, but let's say they don't lose any of those guys early that they're not expecting. Let's say you know Caleb, you know sees out you know sees us out to his senior year, and Carton and Lydell and Gaffney all stick it out to at least their sophomore seasons. Boy, that roster in 2020-2021 season uh, is going to be as potentially impressive looking as any basketball roster, including the 07 team that Ohio State has arguably had since, you know, maybe the 60 national title team. Uh, it, it could be really, really good on paper. Yeah, you know who it would kind of remind me of a little bit and maybe even but more flashy, mate? well, probably a little more flashy, is this year's Michigan State team. Because they were so balanced at each and every position. I mean, the Cassius could beat you. Uh, the um, what's the shooting guard? Uh, he could get Matt, hot. Yeah, Matt in, McQuaid. In, yeah, Matt McQuaid. McQuaid. He could hurt you. Then you have Goins that could come out and hurt you. Tillman could get loose down low, and we would have such a balanced attack. You got the two the two big guys coming in on that can step out to the wing you just talked about you'll have luther and you'll have dj and then you'll have caleb as that down low player it will be so balanced across the board and those are teams that you know how do you beat a team like that that's what i think a lot of people ran into with michigan state well how, do we just have to pick who we let beat us well and johnny that's it's interesting you bring that up because that was kind of kind of the theme that i i had on on the monday podcast after the national championship game because did you notice all four Final Four teams kind of had, you know, they all could play defense and they were all physical. But beyond that, like you're saying, they all had depth and and a lot of balanced scoring. And, I, and I'm wondering, is this a trend we're seeing in college basketball where you don't want to rely on the freshmen, you don't want to rely on one or two big-time scorers that could go cold? And, and not that, you know, Zion Williamson and R.J. Barrett ever went cold because they didn't, but Duke didn't have enough depth at, you know, scoring beyond those two to cut it. And ultimately, I wonder if Ohio State is in a position to benefit if this is a trend in college basketball, and, and it's too soon to call it a trend, but if it is, Ohio State is in great position the next couple of years because theoretically they're going to have a very deep, balanced roster with a lot of guys that can contribute in many different ways. Man, you, you uh, are – speak into what I really believe in. And I think I started becoming a believer into it after seeing uh, Coach K win it all in 2015. And then you see Roy Williams show up several times in the national championship. And he he did it more with that talented but senior roster. Then you see Villanova do it. Kyle, I don't know if you know this about me. I'm a converted UK basketball fan. I grew up a UK basketball fan. But, and I'm, I don't blame Coach Calipari for the one and done because what do you want him to do? Not get the best players? <laughs> but when it comes to longevity in the tournament, it seems that a really good player who will stay around for some seniority and building a team off of that actually does you better in the tournament than uh, just the one and done. And like, because how often does an Anthony Davis come along? Be honest. So I think Holtman's strategy it seems to be he's getting those guys that are on the threshold of leaving early, but probably not, and get building the best team you can have around them. So I think that's a that's a that is the new blueprint over the one and done for tournament success. Well, and you've noticed, you know, John Calipari is a good example of that because. He hasn't completely abandoned the one and done, although they have been losing out those those elite one and dones to Duke recently. But he hasn't abandoned right. the concept. They're still going after those kids. They just haven't been getting them as frequently. But what's interesting? Yeah, is, like make no make no mistake about it. Coach Cal would have taken Zion Williams. Yeah, yeah. Cal, Calipari <laughs> wanted Zion. It's not that was not a choice to back off of Zion. They they tried to get him to the to the very end. But he has kind of adjusted his philosophy just a little bit in that now you see them going after some of these upperclassmen transfers, the grad transfers especially. You know, Reed Travis was a great example from Stanford this past year. They're taking the kid from Bucknell, who's a very good low post scorer. Uh, he'll be in there next year. You can see 
that Calipari has realized the importance of these older kids, and he's trying to take advantage of that and fill out the roster a little better so that they're not dependent on those freshmen all the time. Yeah, and, and what what else points to the fact then that it is changing and the way to win is going away from that style than for a guy who's hung his hat on that style like Coach Cal to start changing up. I think I think he's seen the writing of the wall. Like you said, you got to have some balance in there. And I will just tell the fans right now, the way we're doing it now with Holtman is so much more fan-friendly. Part of the reason why I quit with UK, again, it wasn't I, – I don't blame – the coach or the system for, for the, you know, what they were doing there. It was tiring to keep up with. I mean, you, if you follow recruiting, I know you do Kyle, you imagine the cycle just starting over every single year. I couldn't do it. It got really tiring as a fan. Uh, and you, and there was no emotional connection with the players. So I think the way we're doing it is also more fan friendly. Yeah. I think this, look, you know, as much as we like to, to joke about Michigan being a basketball school and, and get our you know jokes in and, and poke fun of them, you know John Beeline has a great thing going up there for Michigan and basketball right now, and you know you're seeing it with Chris Beard at Texas Tech, Tony Bennett at Virginia has been doing it for the last several years. I feel like right now what Chris Holtman is doing is in that conversation of those coaches right there. And I think that's a great way to build a program because you've got some talent. You've got some top 50 kids coming in that will probably be around two or three years. Not necessarily. I mean, there's always a possibility of a one and done here and there, but you're going to see the talent, but you're also going to fill it out with some, some role players and a much deeper roster. And I think that is the way right now in this atmosphere of college basketball I think that is the way to build a roster you may not have as high of a percentage chance of winning a title as the Dukes or the Kentuckys but it's good enough that you can win you can make a run and you can be more consistent in the long term and not have as much roster turnover turnover and I think you're right I think for a fan that's the great greatest place you could possibly be no absolutely I completely agree and it's going to be a fun ride going forward it is going to be a very fun ride, very interesting ride. Ohio State basketball, um, you know, interestingly enough, by ESPN, they were ranked 10th in the preseason next year. ESPN had Ohio State football ranked 12th in the football poll for next year. It is strange times we're living in. And by the way, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think Ohio State should probably be a few spots lower in basketball and a several spots higher in football. So I'm not agreeing necessarily saying it's right, but it is funny to talk about. Well, anyway, Johnny, uh, so I'm very excited. You're coming over from Virginia Saturday. Uh, we will get a hangout with, uh, with Corey and, and, God forbid, Trent, if he doesn't annoy us too much. Uh, Savage Edits, <laughs> as you probably know him on Twitter. Uh, but it is really exciting. I'm glad you're coming over for the first spring game. And even though the game itself has kind of lost its luster with the format, it'll be a lot of fun for us all to get a hangout and watch some Ohio State football together. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to... For having me on, I have a Trent and I actually have a small token of our appreciation for your. It'll be a nice uh, keepsake for your for your for Podcast Central there oh, uh, gift that we're going to present you with. And yeah, it's going to be fun. Uh, my wife is a uh, a donut fiend, so we're going to get to visit Buckeye, <laughs> Buckeye donuts. donuts. You'll know when yeah. you see. She's a big old girl. I, I got in this. I got into uh, an argument with somebody the other day that tried to say Little Donuts was better than Buckeye Donuts, and I'm like, what? I, I, I mean, I wanted to lay at the smackdown like the Rock on that person. That was just a. <laughs> uh, they were a jabroni what? for even suggesting that. <laughs> well, it'll be our first time, so we. I hope we enjoy it, and I'm looking forward to it. Well, it should be a lot of fun. The Ohio State spring game coming up at noon. Uh, on Saturday at Ohio State, uh, it's like I said, the, the format, I, I'm, I'll take a wait-and-see approach. I'll try to give it a chance, but there will be no tackling. Ten-minute quarters, running clock in the second half. It's probably going to be a snooze fest, but, hey, it's spring football. we gotta, we got to rest our laurels on something. So, uh, well, thanks again to Johnny for joining us. Uh, you can catch him on Twitter at ScarletGreatJL. And, of course, the Scarlet and Great podcast runs every Wednesday here on the Unscripted Ohio Network. Our podcast, the the Unscripted Ohio podcast, runs every Monday and Friday. You can catch us on BuckeyeGrove.com, and you can catch both shows on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. That's going to do it for us, Johnny and Kyle. Hope everybody has a great weekend. Enjoy the spring game. Enjoy the Masters. Enjoy the Game of Thrones premiere. Enjoy the Columbus Blue Jackets who upset Tampa in the first game. 
Uh, let's see what they can do coming back to Columbus for Sunday night. That's going to wrap it up. Hey, we'll see you again Monday, everybody. Have a good one. You can get new episodes of Unscripted Ohio on Mondays and Fridays exclusively at BuckeyeGrove.com or anytime on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things Ohio State. 